So, hi everybody. Hi Prague here in this magnificent castle. Hi Istanbul. Uh, so yeah, today we're gonna talk about uh, decentralized front ends and alternative front ends, wh why and how. And uh, just as, uh, let's say, wh why the title now has been shortened to just alternative front ends, it is uh, because uh, we believe... In Istanbul, okay. So I'm waiting for... for Okay, I keep saying random things exactly as uh, as Tim suggests uh, uh, until uh, until we get the sound in Istanbul as well. Just just uh, ping me so when the when you can hear us uh, from from Istanbul. Um, so meanwhile, I, I can just tell you how that uh, Prague is a is a lovely city. So <laughs> no, I'm just I'm just joking. Okay, it's gone, it's gone. Okay, perfect. So, getting back to the title. So, the, the original full title was uh, Alternative Front Ends and Decentralized Front Ends, Why and How. And we just shortened it to Alternative Front Ends because uh, every talk that we had until today uh, shows that front ends should be decentralized. So, that goes without saying. So, we've seen uh, that we can deploy decentralized front ends uh, and using if limo until the process uh, support properly ENS resolution, but then ENS to IPNS to, to IPFS. So basically, we have a way to, uh, let's say, ensure that uh, fr from a domain we, we are pointing to the right resource. But what's the resource exactly? So talking about front ends, uh, we take the source code, uh, which can be pretty big, we'll get back to this, uh, we generate build artifacts, and then we store these artifacts on IPFS. But if we look a bit more precisely at uh, the source code of these artifacts, which are now safely deployed on IPFS in a decentralized manner, uh, and we look around it, we see and we find some links to uh, here, let's say, uh, an API. Uh, and here it's, it's normal IPFS. And uh, if we look, uh, use some tools like BuiltWith or others, we see that this is pointing to an EC2 uh, instance, uh, which basically uh, that does not fill the, the, the build enough. So when you're a project, you're writing your smart contracts, you deploy them on chain that can be properly decentralized, of course, and there's many, many talks on the L1 that just uh, finished now. Uh, the front end itself, the build artifacts, you can put them on IPFS. Uh, but there's also uh, an API and, uh, which is uh, not decentralized, at least not by default and, and not quite often. Uh, and I would say one more thing is uh, the client code. Uh, can be responsible for doing the, the RPC calls and uh, managing the RPC calls. And uh, as even Vitalik mentioned it, that uh, the, the nodes themselves, uh, the decentralization should, should be uh, well thought. And that includes the way uh, these connections are written in the clients themselves. So decentralized versus alternative. Why alternative go as well beyond decentralized? Uh, project can be maybe forced to, to, to shut down. Uh, Front-end operators might have legal risks and uh, teams can, can lose interest as well, uh, abandon the code base. So we see from, uh, in sense, the, the, the market going from bull market to bear market and uh, some project disappear. But the smart contracts, they're, 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 still, they're still on basically. Uh, users, if it's a DeFi project, can still have liquidity that uh, they, they, they can freely withdraw using the contracts. But if there's no more front end, for many users, uh, it, it will be harder to, to, to do. So that's why the uh, importance of having alternative front ends uh, matters for everybody and especially for the users. And the main question then is uh, how can we trust these alternative front ends. Uh, and how can we trust even beyond the built artifacts, the API? Uh, knowing that uh, for a reason of uh, client diversity, which uh, will definitely help us uh, resist censorship, uh, we probably need not a, a redeployment of the original front end repos. So the key issue, it's trust. And how easily 
when we see a front end, when we know this is an alternative front end, uh, how can we trust this as a user? If it's not the original project, how do we know that uh, this front end is safe to use? And if we look at, let's say, a simplified architecture, so we have the, our build artifacts, we have um, multiple SDKs which have been embedded in, the, in those artifacts, create uh, an interface which connects to RPC, API, etc. So obviously, we should trust the, the, the URL or the, the, the ENS when properly decentralized. We should trust the API, and we've seen that uh, most often it's centralized. And uh, we should trust the, the RPC node. And that's another thing. And which is one big thing we're going to talk right now about is we should also trust the front-end implementation itself. Uh, because if you look at what's a front-end, and for instance, this is an example of one single page of Uniswap and Liquidity, uh, which uh, overall is 500 lines of JavaScript code, not counting uh, a lot of different libraries, SDK components, hooks, etc. So if we include all of them, we're talking thousands of lines of code to just build an interaction. Uh, so we, we are including Web3 React uh, here, uh, React itself, lots and lots of components. And what's lost uh, among those lines is the semantics of the transaction that we want to perform. Uh, what exactly uh, are we going to compute to build the transaction and then submit that transaction? And if you look, you, you can go on hundreds uh, hundreds of lines, and you have bits of the semantics which are spread in, those, in this code base. Some in the page of the method itself, some in some uh, components or hooks, and put together you have, you see tiny bits of computation, uh, a bit of slippage here, uh, a bit of determining whether it's native uh, ETH or an ERC-20 token, uh, how do we uh, then call the, the, the estimation, etc., etc. So the front-end code is very complex and it has a lot of dependencies and because of that, one of the main problems, if we want to have alternative front-ends and if we want to gain trust in those alternative front-ends, is it's hard to verify and it's hard to maintain as well. This code base uh, evolves permanently and, and each uh, update basically should trigger a whole new audit or a new look at. And if you multiply this by the number of projects you have, hundreds of projects, thousands of projects on chain. If you want to make sure that each of the front end that you use is safe, there's a lot of work. We thought at OK Contract about one solution that involves uh, building a common implementation for front ends. Right now, project A has its built artifact monolith, project B, uh, two and three as well. And the bits of semantics are highlighted in color. They are here among a lot of boilerplate or, or generic uh, code. What we should do instead is uh, maybe build a unique engine which works for any kind of transactions and having much shorter specifications and descriptions of the transactions that we want to, to, to perform and uh, that will simplify considerably the way that uh, we, we need to, uh, the time we need to spend basically to, to look at them to make sure that we can trust them. And as well, we can also have a generic layer for UI generation. And uh, that layer will help mostly for security. So we are reducing a bit of freedom on how we can design things uh, exactly as designers want. But uh, since it's uh, automated, there's less code as well to edit. So what's this? It's trust. And the second thing is minimalism. And the way to minimally uh, describe what a transaction, what interaction we want to do is to specify it properly. And for that, we will introduce really soon uh, the, the, the open source repos of Lambda Script, which is a purely functional language that specifies a transaction, kind of a, let's say, low level intent or high level description of a transaction. This is, for instance, what it looks for a swap. Uh, but if you look for ad liquidity, it's uh, about twice the size. It's still very, very short. And basically, it says, OK, we're sending uh, to the, the, the wallet that submits the transaction 
uh, token A is fixed, but could, could be left to the, as a search box. Uh, the path, the deadline, how we compute the amount out min, which is the parameter that the, the, the method uh, requires. And this definition, basically we can uh, use a compiler to generate some bytecode which describes this transaction. At compile time, we can detect some errors if the transaction is not properly specified, and then have a common transaction engines we take the user inputs and build the transaction directly from clients. Because of the separation of the specification and the runtime, basically it's a much smaller amount of code for each project and each interaction, that makes it easy to verify. And the single common runtime, that will fully open source of course as well, uh, can be multiple times uh, audited and independently. For instance, uh, now we're, we're working uh, with Optimism and uh, we'll probably uh, try to, to, to audit uh, on, on uh, their side and, uh, and several other uh, people will be able to, to audit that common runtime. And another thing in trust is that since we have this shorter description of the interactions, anyone should be able to attest that this is a correct one. And for many people, uh, in fact, that the community cares about, like the project itself, maybe us, uh, maybe chains, or trusted members or, or in the community, or the, the Ethereum Foundation, who knows, can uh, create attestations that, okay, this uh, interactions to add liquidity on that project, it is valid, the computation is valid, so basically we can attest that this is correct, and these uh, signatures should be stored on chain, so that is completely separate from the rest of the API nodes which provide the, the, the definition. And the last step is, as I mentioned, the automated interface generation. So UI matters for the end users, and uh, if we only have the definition that we mentioned about the semantics, and then we have a common universal runtime and a definition to UI generator as well, which is common for all projects, then we can be sure uh, that the, the, there are less problems with the security of the build artifacts than uh, that, that we can run. You all maybe remember that uh, BadgerDAO was hacked through the front end for 120 mil. What happened about two years ago was that the attackers managed to, to inject uh, some code in the front end to, to uh, make approvals, in fact, for, for talk, user tokens to their, their own addresses. But they were clever. In fact, people started approving tokens uh, and they didn't do anything. They just kept the approval and just uh, uh, watch the approval key, um, going. And when a whale came in and approved for 50 million, now they say, okay, it's time to collect our benefits. And they, they, they reaped every approvals that, uh, that they had. So because of that, we need to, me to really minimize the way, in fact, uh, we have code uh, in our front ends. And that includes for us, no external dependencies as well. Uh, in a similar manner, KyberSwap was uh, attacked through Google Tag Manager. And if you look at most of the project today, and uh, this is a discussion that uh, was mentioned uh, a couple, a few talks ago uh, about data collection and privacy. Basically, most of the front ends right now use Google Tag Manager. And a Google Tag Manager is a vector for injection attacks uh, uh, as well. So, if we have these two engines, we have our program, so the, the short definition of the semantics that we directly compile to a UI automatically. And we also have the runtime that will, from the, the UI, build the transaction. And that works. So in the, the, the let's say, test nets uh, that we are doing right now, uh, we, these are actual screenshots of different kind of interactions that we can generate. And so this is not fully customizable, but we'll have an SDK for that, which is another thing. But for these interactions, it's still nice enough for the end users. And uh, we believe it's a way to, to reduce the, the, the complexity and so to increase the trust. 
So if you want to uh, take away two things, is we talked about trust and minimalism, and I think that trust minimalism is, is the way to, to properly build alternative front ends. Uh, so if we look back at the architecture, what we propose is to have this single alternative UI, which can just take the definition, uh, the short definition of the semantics, and build a UI for that. I didn't have time today uh, to mention how we can have decentralized API nodes as well for that, and, uh, but that's definitely a, a way to do it. So we can deploy these static builds, which can provide alternative UIs, default front ends, uh, using generated UI and uh, universal runtime, and as well decentralize the API nodes. So this can create, let's say, a repository of interactions where we can find uh, interactions and alternative UIs for most of the DeFi or NFT operations or, or the new use cases that will come for, for blockchain. And what we will be able to have is the community vetting that the definitions are correct and independently that the common runtime uh, for these interaction is correct. So that's uh, um, the conclusion of this. So uh, if you want to, to contribute, uh, maybe I think uh, we could uh, work on an EIP to, to specify the transaction part and uh, really uh, looking to, to have uh, also others uh, contributors to, to that. And if you're a, a project uh, and want to ensure you have alternative front ends, we'll, we'll pretty soon release everything, but you can contact us uh, to, to be in the, let's say, the private uh, betas uh, before we publicly launch. Uh, so you have the, the URL where, okay, contract uh, on Twitter. And uh, we just created, uh, in fact, a Telegram group if you want to join it, and uh, we'll probably announce uh, things there. Thanks. Do you have any questions? Um, you mentioned a very proprietary vector attacks, uh, specifically uh, by the injection of the Google Tech Manager and so on and so forth. Uh, we we were having here the Web3 privacy also the the meetup before the the events over here, and one of the aspects which are there re re referring to the DeFi projects is that quite many of them I don't know uh, due to the VCs uh, requirements or something they are using you know, the uh, Google Tech Manager and all these things to, to identify the user adoption and so on. Um, this is a tremendous issue and I don't know in, in which extent it is being solved by the formal specification of the transaction when actually quite often this vector is misused by replacing the to address, you know, uh, which is then combined with the secondary uh, uh, attack uh, vector attack of being of having the uh, phishing smart contract, which seems similar but behaves differently. So, um, is this the formal specification which would be attested and so on? Uh, is this also addressing this issue that we are interacting with a different contract, or that we might be we might have the replaced only like the um, beneficiary address? Good question. So basically, uh, I sum it up as how can we trust that uh, we are interacting with the right contracts? Is, yeah. Uh, so basically, when we specify the program, uh, so the, the, the definition of the semantics, that, that includes the contract. So when I mentioned that the community can be involved, uh, like the project itself, uh, signing that and attesting that, yeah, yeah, th this is a genuine interaction. That not only includes the, the, build, the values computed and, and submitted, but also the addresses that we're interacting with. So if someone creates a, a fake token, that, that will show up in the short definition, which anybody can review, and, and, and most probably uh, nobody that, uh, that is trustable will, will uh, vet for this kind of fake interactions. Yeah, another question? Uh, 
just a second uh, second part of the question was if there was the attack direct, uh, directing towards the beneficiary address. So not not only towards the smart contract replacement, but just replacing the beneficiary. Yeah. So okay, the beneficiary address. Then it's it's a user input, and um, if you see in in the definition, uh, let me come back here. Uh, okay. So here we see that the beneficiary is uh, uh, self. And uh, what we can do is, uh, so, so for now, uh, we, can, we have an additional field, in fact, in the specification, which are some security rules that say that this two value is sensible and that, for instance, uh, it, it should be either the, the wallet submitting the transaction or somehow an address which is whitelisted for that user. And uh, this is just the beginning, but uh, there's probably a lot that we, we can do in this space as well. Um, there are some questions on the chat. Uh, basically, uh, asking about how does discovery work for websites in IPFS? Is there a DHT crawler? Um, so can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, so here in what I mentioned, so basically we'll probably want to, uh, for, for the alternative front end, so there's two, two, two ways to answer. First, we'll have just one main deployment of the engine, which takes a parameter, and the parameter being the identifier of the transaction specification. So basically, there's, uh, there's not too many uh, in fact, uh, deployment that, that should be one uh, single address and IPFS uh, CID, and most probably a CID uh, which has been audited. And uh, if we have a development version, basically, that's another deployment. Uh, but the, the, the one that we should point to once we have finished properly implemented uh, a first revision is the, 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 the audited one. Uh, and uh, there was a second part of the question, sorry. And uh, asking about DHT specifically. Oh, yeah. So n right now we, we don't do anything specific. Uh, but yeah, of course, there's, there's room for improvement. Cool. Thanks.